Nerds International proudly presents Alpine, the fourth realm of Earth. A world of fantasy adventure awaiting your imagination. Warp Shell, a universe in ruin. Countless heroic tales waiting to be weaved through space and time. Ghost Mountain, a place caught between heaven and hell, filled with fireside tales of the Wild West. These are the words of Index Card RPG, and this is a podcast about those worlds. Welcome to the Threat Streets and Timers podcast, episode 11. I am one of your hosts, Gary, a.k.a. The Murder Hobo, and I'm here with none other than Victor Diaz. Y'all ready for this? The man, the myth, the legend. What up, my people? You guys know what this is about. It is Threat Streets and Timers time. Does that make sense? A little bit, but that's know. all right. We it, don't it, have to make sense. It's getting late, ladies and gentlemen. We're getting a little wacky, so this might be an interesting episode. Or it might just totally suck, and then you can just throw rocks at us the next time you see us at a convention. Where, where's <laughs> your next convention? RinCon. You're going to RinCon, Victor. I am going to RinCon 2018. So those of you who are in the Arizona area are going to be attending RinCon. I hope to see you there. Please stop me. Say hello. Let me know who you are, where you're from particularly if you're from the local area. I would love to get to know a lot more of the local gamers. I play with a lot of them. I know a lot of them. I went to school with a lot of them. Um, but it's always nice to see some fun faces. For those of you who don't know, Hanker and Farinell is expected to attend the con all weekend. So we'll, me and him will be hanging out, having some good time, talking talk, walking the walk. You guys know how we do. We are going to game our hearts out for ICRPG amongst a few hundred other gamers <laughs> yeah you know it's supposed to be a pretty big con a couple of us have been talking online back and forth on hangouts and facebook and a few other places and um we we they've all said the same thing this is going to be one of the biggest role-playing gaming cons um in arizona in a long time and by biggest i mean you know five six hundred people i i would not i would bet there's probably double that there this year so we're going to see how this goes. One of the really neat things about RingCon is that I'm going to be speaking at the GM workshop. I'm going to be talking about bullet journals for game masters. So if you guys are at the con, please stop by. We're going to me, hanker in, and a couple of the folks are going to be talking about something that's near and dear to our hearts that has to do with game mastering. So come and learn with the rest of us. I look forward mm-hmm. to seeing everybody there. Very cool. Yeah, that's this weekend. And if you don't like this episode, just uh, pick up some rocks. When Victor's not looking, just throw them at him. Oops. I was just going to say, Victor, stop tapping on your microphone, and then I dropped my pop cap. Did you hear that? <laughs> yes, I did. That's what you get. Yeah, that's what you guys get for free podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So, um, yeah, I got nothing on the go. I got some stuff that I'm doing. Uh, I'm working on my TV, which we call it framing thing, trying to get my sweet-ass battle maps up and ready. Um My 50 Fathoms campaign is uh, in full effect, which is pretty good. You know what the one thing that I find that even after like 30 some odd years of DMing, I find that I can catch my mistakes. Um, For example, you know, this one, there's supposed to be this three, um, three climbing checks that you're supposed to make to get up the side of this, this cliff. And the character used elemental manipulation, which I knew was supposed to be like just for little small things. (laughs) <laughs> but he used it to create a bench out of water and then just hoisted himself up. And I just, I, I thought it was cool. I knew it was sort of outside the reach of the spell. But I thought to myself, you know what, we're going to go rule a cool on this deal. But what I should have made him done or do, looking back, excuse me, man, I don't know where that came from, was I should have made him actually roll three spell casting checks to replace the three climbing checks that everybody else had to make just to keep them on the same page. I like that, you know, sometimes I realize later on when it's all said and done, the mistakes that I make still. So at the end of the day, just look at it like this. Does it really matter if he had made three or one check 
to the story. Well, if it if it didn't matter to the story, it didn't necessarily slow them down or give him any major advantage that really, you know, uh, changed the storyline. Then don't worry about it. It's not it's not worth the heartache. It's not worth the effort, quote unquote, that needed to get done in order for you to accomplish, um, you know, what that hazard was about. Besides, it's magic. That's what magic does. It breaks the rules of physics and law as we know it. Mm, I love magic. It's my favorite. But I really feel like I passed up the opportunity to turn this guy into a quadriplegic and have everybody in the 50 Fathoms Pirate Universe push him around in a wheelchair. That would have been sweet. Mm -hmm. We could call him Stumpy. They, well, they were with Stumpy. Stumpy Pete was the pirate guy. They were going to get his treasure. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, Stumpy That's Pete awesome. didn't tell him about the undead giant monkey that was uh, the undead King Kong that was in the bushes waiting for them to show up. It's 50 Fathoms, so awesome. All right, well, let's go talk about some magic. Um, I think we're going to skip the news this week. Maybe we'll come back and insert some news if something interesting happens. Actually, let's pile over to the news, and you can tell me all about the Gauntlet thing that you were talking about this morning. How's that sound? Sounds awesome. Cool. Let's go do the news. we shoot it in the news i just wanted to throw this out there on friday night november 2nd at 6 p.m pst pacific standard time i will be running some index card rpg on the rpg brewery you can find the rpg brewery at www.twitch.tv forward slash the rpg brewery that is this friday november 2nd at 6 p.m pacific standard time I'm going to be running one of the maps that I incorporated in the game. It's going to be Flight of the Red Sword. And uh, I've already built all the maps into Tabletop Simulator. So if you want to see how it works, if, you're, um, you, if you've seen the stuff that I've been posting and you're interested in how Tabletop Simulator works as a uh, virtual or online role-playing game tabletop kind of a deal, uh, come and check it out. You can see the stuff that I've uh, put into the game. Cool. All right, take it away, Victor. News me up, buddy. What's happening? What's new and exciting? All right, so those of you who don't know, Hankerin dropped a video this morning. And he's talking about Gonto Grimm's in his campaign and what he did with his characters or with the whole party. But what, what really interested me was the first part of the video. He goes over two new um, you know, homegrown rules that he has at his table for ICRPG. Now, the first one he went over, which is a new magic spells variant. So one of the things he was talking about was in ICRPG, the basic spell, you know, spell casting role is you make the roll, you roll for effort and it's done. It happens. And you do that much effort or you do that much damage, depending on what the effect of the spell is. Easy peasy. Nothing new. Everybody's used to that. In 5e, okay, you have your daily spell slots. So the number of spells that you can cast per day. And then you have a variety of effects that can have impact those, whether it's range, whether it's, you know, shape of the spell, a line, a cone, uh, a cube, a sphere, whatever, and the various different effects that go with it. In addition to that, there's a lot of complexity. Um, there's many spells that you can cast that have like 10d8, for example, or, you know, 66, a fireball, low level, you know, but fairly complex in its effects and the different methods that all that magic can do. So what they were doing was they came up with a rule at the table. Um, amongst all of them, they came up with this at the end of the night, and he's kind of repeating this and um, reiterating it in his um, in his video this morning. And what he said was, um, now spellcasters can have two options. One, what he calls the roll and repeat. And that's pretty much, you know, you make the roll, the generic ICRPG um, task rule that you need to do. You roll the dice and you roll the dice and you roll the dice and you do magic and you do magic and you do magic. Your spells don't disappear like they do in D&D. But he came up with a new rule called your guaranteed daily spell. So if you want to cast lightning bolt, you got to roll to see if you hit with it. But if you need a guaranteed hit, an automatic um, success on that spell, you can burn the spell away and it'll it'll fade from your from your um, from your character sheet. Everything will happen. The spell will do range. It'll do damage. You roll for effort, but now it's a guaranteed hit. So that was to me that was a big revelation because now you have the option. You know, you can shoot bolt and bolt and bolt and magic missile and you roll to hit as many times as you want. But that one time you need it to hit, 
you can just use your guaranteed daily slot, so to speak, and you can burn that spell away, and that spell will automatically hit. No hit roll is needed. Lose the spell forever. Maybe not forever. Maybe you only lose it for a day. Nice. It comes back, you know, like it comes back into memory. Like you kind of get the feel for it because you expended all the energy in order to make that spell successful. So he calls it roll and roll and repeat versus guaranteed daily, which I think is really neat. It's a really neat mechanic that I want to play with a little more in my home games. I'm going to see how that works for everybody. Yeah, in a in a pinch, you could just kind of just toss that out and uh, sort of get your success out of the deal, and away you go, which is kind of cool. It's sure, like especially um, if it's a big bad end guy, and you you need to make sure that lightning bolt goes off and hits him between the eyes, and not oh damn, I rolled a one kind of thing. <laughs> oh damn, that I happens a too, one. right? <laughs> Yeah, those are the worst, are they not? <laughs> they always happen at the most opportune moment. Oh, that's fantastic. So, so what else was in that things, video? Another one of the things, yeah, that he was talking about was armor soak. Okay, now get this. In ICRPG and in 5e, you get a regular to hit roll. You know, you, you get hit points, and when you get hit, you take damage, you damage, your hit points go down, and eventually you pass out and die. Now, one of the favorite um, systems, and it's one of my favorites too. I, I, I've, I've liked it. I think even before I met um, Hankerin, I, I liked the Black Hack. It was a really great OSR D20 system with a lot of good special rules in it. But one of the things that the Black Hack has is the ability to be able to soak damage. So as the table, they came up with the following rule. And, and, and soaking damage means that your armor is going to take the damage versus you taking the damage physically on your hit points. So let me get the rundown of what this what this rule means. The fighter armor soak pool. The fighter gets to choose to soak damage with his armor or with his hit points. Only fighters, so this makes them tougher. Now this is how it works. The fighter gets hit in a normal ICRPG or any any most D20 RPGs. You roll to hit and you roll for damage. The fighter takes 5 points of damage. His hit points go down by 5 points. But a fighter is allowed to use his armor to soak that up. So say you have an armor class of 14. Well, now you have a pool of 14 points to be able to soak up damage with. It simulates your armor taking the damage, but also reducing your protection because it's getting hacked and slashed and dented and cut. And it's not cutting you physically, but it's cutting, cutting your armor. It's reducing the amount of protection that your armor is giving you. So now it becomes a soak pool for the fighter to choose whether he wants to have his armor take the damage or his hit point pool take the damage. So now you so think about that for a second. So you have somebody, a fighter, with 10 hit point heart and an armor class of 15. He takes five points of damage from the dragon's claw. He has the choice to take off five points off of his armor class, uh, his armor pool, or five points out of his hit point pool. Now, here, here's my question as far as that goes then. You got you got a 15 AC. You get whacked for five, and you take the five off. Do you now have an armor class of 10? Or do you it's have a... You. It's up to you on how you want to handle it. That's what he was talking about. There's a lot of variation to that rule. It's up to you and your table on how you want to handle it. Do you want to reduce your armor down, it, therefore making it easier for you to, to take damage? Or do you want to just keep your armor as at 15 and and i was thinking about it like this if your armor class is 15 you get a pool of 15 points the armor class always stays 15 but your point your soak pool goes down and down and down and down then when you um no longer have a soak pool your armor is destroyed or it's too it's so hacked and slashed up to a point where it's no longer protecting you so you just get your basic 10 armor class yeah and your armor gets destroyed and you only get your basic 10 armor class does that make sense yeah, yeah. Or it would be would, like a it would be like a fighter feat that allows you to soak uh to, that gives you a soak pool based off of your armor class. So the higher your armor class, the higher your pool is gonna be, but it doesn't change your armor until your all your armor gets dropped down to zero. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, fifteen points of armor, boom, all of a sudden uh, you know, you 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 lose a piece of armor, right. your you know, maybe your helmet flies off or Something like sure. that becomes completely Yeah, your unusable. shield gets broken in half. One of your um, shoulder um, protection or your breastplate gets a big slash across it. Maybe, you know, yeah, you knock off a shin guard or something. You could even do lots of variations to it. I was talking to my kids about it earlier, just before we got to recording the podcast today. And I was telling them, you know, you could do your armor class is 
is a hit point pool or a soak pool. You can just do one heart of um, armor soak. So you get 10 points, regardless of what your armor class is. You only get 10 points. Once those 10 points are gone, you have to apply them to your HP, but you can pick and choose which hits you want as a fighter only, right? Um, maybe you could come up with just a couple of points. Maybe your your armor bonus and your um, constitution bonus are the only pool that it creates. It varies, right? Maybe you can make variations off of that rule. But either way, the fighter would get the advantage of having a soak pool to be able to soak up some of those um, really hard hits. You know, when you only have 10 hit points and something like a goblin shoots an arrow in your eye for eight points of damage. The last thing you're going to do is going to say, oh, damn, I'm left at two points. Now the fighter can turn his head slightly and have it absorb into his um, helmet or, you know, raise up his shield in time to block it. But now he has an arrow in his shield. So it effectively reduces the amount of protection that he has. But that makes a fighter a little more effective. Now, what was really cool is, you know, that was blew my mind, you know, sitting here frying in my own juices, so to speak. But what was really cool is later on in the game, they started to notice that the uh, that the soak pool was getting low. And they're like, oh, no, my armor is getting destroyed. And it's like, well, you better find something to repair it or you better use a repair skill or find an armor or something. And the, and the player character, uh, the player was saying, I didn't even think to do that. I didn't even think that I could repair it or or how I would do it. So one of the key things that Hank Hearn was telling everybody was make sure that you tell the fighters that they're going to need either a repair skill or loot that allows them to repair armor or they're going to look for an armor so they can regain that soak pool back because the soak pool is permanent until it gets repaired. It doesn't come back at the end of the turn. It doesn't come back at the end of the day. You know, oh, I'm going to take a breather and do a recovery roll. You don't do recovery rolls for soak. You do them for hit points but you don't do them for soak. And, and it was that static pool of just a couple of hits that can keep the fighter going a little bit longer than everyone else or absorb a really devastating blow, um, it totally blowing his soak pool, but he's still got all of his hit points. So there's a really nice variations that I think that could create for a lot of different archetypes or a lot of different classes. How are you, the fighter. How are you going to go about um, putting, putting repair onto your player? Um, I, I know that a lot of times, like we, when we were armor talking about... Armor repair kit. Yeah, well, so th that's, a, that's a great idea, armor repair kit. So just We have like it for weapon aid. kit. We have it for everything else. Just yeah. have them. It allows you to make one roll every day or every... Um, you know, every hour or something, and they get a plus two to the roll because of the tools and the ability, and they roll it, and it could be just a recovery roll. Uh, you know, uh, an armor repair kit, automatic recovery roll for um, your soak pool for fighters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you know, it's maybe it's got some some uh, rivets and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean, a, a yeah, small some hammer, yeah, leather and... straps, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, some malleable pieces of metal, or or even just a, you know, um, you know, hardened leather that you can use as a patch kit. You know, how many times have we seen in movies where the armors are all beat up, or they're wearing two or three different types of armor? Maybe the arm, you know, the armor repair kit has uh, an older piece of armor or a cheaper, um, smaller, lightweight piece of armor or just one big breastplate, uh, you know, whatever, wherever you need it to be. Uh, it just allows you the ability to be able to regain some of those soak points back into your soak pool. I'm sure you could always rip armor off of your foes laying in the ground. You know what sure. I mean? This guy's got and a breastplate. The, yeah, use the pliers, the tin snips, and the mm -hmm. and the rivets to be able to repair your own armor with the kit that you have. Sure. Um, that that would you, be totally legit, right? Because the story are cool. Are you going um are you going int or wisdom on the for the repair skill? Agility. Well, which is actually dexterity. What are, you, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I would, uh, you know, I would, uh, for a fighter, I would say, um, yeah, it's got to be intelligence, right? Yeah. Everything everything in my gut is telling me it's an intelligence role. It's a, it's a knowledge skill. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a dexterity. You do have to have some, you know, but if you look at all the other games, Pathfinder, Dozen Dragons, everything else, all those repair skills come out of intelligence almost always. So I would yeah. say make an intelligence role. And yeah, yeah, if you don't have a fighter that's very smart, okay, he's it's not going to be pretty, but he's going to pull it off. I don't remember what skill check Hank was using when he was creating or crafting items with his character from Sea of Rust. Possibly it was wisdom, but I'm not 100% sure. But I, I thought that was just wicked. He basically, he's just like, yeah, I'm going to make this thing. I'm going to make this little drone and uh, punch in some GPS coordinates and uh, have it send this crystal back to where the warp shell is. And I'm like, he just made a check. I, well, no, I'm not sure. Is it a hard check? 
It's not a hard check. You just make a check, a successful check. Yeah, I think it was just a successful check. I think he just needed to have a regular normal check, so to speak. It's not easy. It's not hard. If he was doing that in the middle of a snowstorm, okay, it might be hard. Or if he was you know, sitting in the middle of his repair shop, it would be easy because he had all the tools and materials that he needs to be able to do it. So That's you got to the... kind of make that call as you go. But yeah, I'm, it's just that kind of things that I think a lot of players don't think about when they're at the table as it takes a lot of mental energy to come up with that kind of creative solutions. With the easy and hard mechanic, just like you just said, in, in two sentences, you nailed it. If you're in your shop building this thing, it's an easy roll. If you're in the middle of nowhere, it's a hard roll. My question sort of more tended towards building or creating a new spell. If you're creating a new spell, you have to make a hard int or a hard wisdom roll to create whatever effect it is that you want. Is, is that how the rules go kind of a thing? To create a completely different new spell. You want to create this effect. Um, I want to create a spell that, uh, you know. Yeah, one that one that everybody knows, Fireball, right? You're, you're going to use a, the verb and the noun combo that is on page 47 under spell creation. You take a look at those, and this is, again, the genius of Hankering, those three sentences that narrow down the entire rule set for spell creation. With a hard int roll, you create a spell if you give it enough effort. Most of the times I ask the player character to come up with 10 points of effort, you know, one heart's worth of effort. Um, and it can be significant because sometimes if you roll really low three or four times in a row, you're still rolling for effort, still trying to make that spell. Um, the second sentence is the spell must be a verb noun combo. So for example, it gives the example of create stone, but we're talking about fire and ball, um, you know, basic spells. And then the GM may set a time required to complete. So you can do one to four minutes, one to four hours, one through four hours, one through four hearts, or 1D four hearts. There is a difference in there. Um, and you just determine the stats and the details between the player and the GM. It's that simple. Those simple three things make an entire spell creation system for a role-playing game. And that just, for me, that just blows my mind, the simplicity of it. But I love it. And that's the magic that makes uh, that makes Runehammer games. It's really good stuff. Um, cool. I just found That's it. how I would do it. That's how I would do it, honestly. I would just pick one heart and let them do it. Unless they're like, you know, I want to reverse time an hour. Okay, well, that's going to take a lot more than one heart. You're going to have to go find a unicorn horn, a black dragon's, you know, um, spit, and a few other things in addition to one to four months of research and, you know, um, some coin and some hired hands and a few other things because, you know, that's going to be game-changing. Or if it's just a lightning bolt, just a... Um, you know, um, make a clay golem, raise dead, that kind of stuff. Maybe one or two hearts, maybe even three or four. I, or maybe I'll make him roll for it. At the end of the day, the mechanics are not as important as the story. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, in, in order to keep some symmetry along or throughout the system, to keep it simple and to keep it similar. You hear that? That beeping noise? Must be the, must be the neighbor's... Uh car or something like that and yeah, i'm cutting that part out anyways to keep it simple and keep it some like some symmetry throughout the system you should like i would personally apply that same mechanic so that the um the, the same you use the same mechanics that you use to cast a spell as you do to do things like repair your armor um so it's going to be like sure. a hard a hard whatever check that you decided to be so that you always you know there's not always these different complicated rules just like you know like when you when you when you're attacking with a weapon, no matter what it is, it does d6. It's it's simplistic beauty in that form. All right. Well, that said, let's put a pin in this. Was there anything else cool in the Gauntlet Grim video that I missed? Because I'm actually uh, right now converting it to MP3 so I can listen to that video tomorrow at work. Yeah, you want to take a look at that. There's a few fun things that he talked about. Some of the story that happened, some of the combat mechanics that they were doing. But that was the two main hitters for me at the very beginning of the uh, the video that he talks about really kind of turned all that stuff on my head and i'm thinking great how am i going to incorporate this into my chimera game because that uses a spell <laughs> system and i'm like um ow so you know i'm making notes i'm over here spend dice burn dice that kind of stuff trying to see how that's going to work so yeah there was there's some good stuff in as a whole it was it was a good video for hanker and appreciate the appreciate the work hank i know it doesn't happen overnight I sent him an email the other day, and I think I posted on uh, what you would call it on Twitter. There, the the Doom Vault thing did it for me. I, I thought that was absolutely spectacular. Uh, you want to give your patrons that map, a gift? Though, that map, yeah. the one with the cross hatching, that was sick. Top down of the Doom Vault, one of his best. 
Yeah, you want to do some cool stuff, create a map and an adventure and explain it as you're drawing it and stuff. I thought that was fantastic. That is totally, I don't know what it is, but I I have a hunger for that because that... You and about the <laughs> 6,000 people that follow Hank Green on his YouTube page, there are so many people and it, it amazes me. It really honestly amazes me the amount of people that want to watch creators make adventures and explain, well, why are you using a dragon there? Well, why is that log there? Well, why is the rock there? Well, why is that 14? Why is it not 15? I mean, they have these little questions that they come up with as they're going. And for someone to be able to sit down and look at a simple map and turn it into a creative encounter the way Hankerin does it, you know, entertainingly, intelligently, and coherently, um, that's that's the genius that is Runehammer Games. It really, yeah. really is because there's so many people that want to see that and very few people have the experience, the capability, and the creativity to be able to do that well. And I think that's one part of Hankering's success. Um, in other words, Hankering, we want you to do more of those kind of videos. Absolutely. I'm going to lean in and give you my sexy voice. Please, Hankering, give me some more of them sweet Doom Vault maps. Yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, he could draw maps and put the keys on the right-hand side and the map on the left-hand side of every page every day of the week. And at the end of the year, it'd be, you know, 356, 65 pages, whatever, um, 300 plus pages of, of a really great um, just encounter maps. It, it's it's art. I mean, you could put them on the wall and you could you can watch them. It's just the way he does them. His style, his method, the whole uh, Sharpie technique. Absolutely love it. But we've yeah. said that before. We think he's a genius, a mad genius. But a genius nonetheless. Very cool. All right, let's skip over to the main topic. What are we talking about today? We're going to do something here, aren't we? Yeah, I, well, I hope so. Other than talk about hankering, I hope we're going to do something. We're such fanboys, man. It's so nerdy. <laughs> we love hankering. It's, oh, man. You know, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I've said it a million times. I, I'm a fan of people who take risks and put themselves out there and are honest, creative individuals that are not afraid to um, speak their mind or put their hearts out on paper and, and bear their souls to the world. People don't realize as artists how difficult that is, to, how difficult it is to just be yourself and put yourself out there and show everybody all of your um, faults and all of your uh, all of your creative genius. Um, it's, it's just wonderful to see. It's, it's wonderful to see a human being who can open himself up with that way and take that risk. And there's not a lot of them out there, so I'm glad he's doing it. Anyways, cool. we're talking about spellcaster options, minds and mysteries. So one, that it's a quick little article that talks about answering the questions of, you know, what is what is magic? How are those forces creating? Is it limitless power? What are the consequences if you misuse it? All really important questions you need to be asking your players at the table of what are the minds and mysteries that make up magic for your character and for your game? Because it's much more than just a D20 roll. Um, consider the options and amplify the role to extend magic in your game. And there's a whole slew of options. The first one is the different schools of magic, spell books, backfire, holy backfire. And we were talking about spell creation a little bit ago, and there's also formless magic. So one of the biggest ones that we start out with is schools of magic. And that one has four separate sub paragraphs for it. Um, he does say in the rule book that you need to choose to commit to only one of those types to that if you do so it'll add a lot of dimension to your caster so we'll start off with the first one and the one one of my favorites the school of yog now for those of you who haven't seen it yet the index card role playing game on the g plus community page has my books um my spell books of yog the book of yog one and book of yog two and those are a bunch of different spells in there so take a look at that and give me some feedback if you guys see anything that you like or don't like or want to see added to those so um, going back to the school of yog here he talks about the arcane forces that are ancient crystals that require two things for you to harness a crystal and an incantation so if you're from the school of yog your character is going to start out with one heart of these small little crystal fragments on a failed spell cast you can reduce the count by one so in other words you can burn up a crystal and you can replenish your crystal supply or lose your casting ability at whenever you become zero. So if you run out of these crystals, you can no longer cast spells. Yeah, think about that for a minute. If you run out of the crystals, you can no longer cast spells. Um, also, having crystals lets you store up to five spells um, in a spell book. So part of the School of Yog and all the rules go with it for the School of Magic for that one. I think it's pretty interesting. It, it can really um, 
put a twist on traditional spell casting. Man, I had my mute, my mute, uh, my, my mic muted. Stupid. That's that was for me. It's crazy coming from D and D where you have yeah. so e- even in fifth edition like in fifth edition if you look in the dm's guide in the back of the book there is an actual spell points variation that you can take um it tells you to go through the different classes you know some classes that aren't quite spell casters get a reduced amount of spell points um let's say you, you know if you're playing like you're you're straight up uh, warlock or whatever you get 40 points but a paladin can also cast spells or um you know, one of the one of the a other sorcerer fighting is classes. a good example, or a, a paladin, a cleric. Right, all of those are good examples. They all have different variations of spell points that they can use. And spell points, people think that's new or that's something innovative. Spell points have been around almost to the first edition of D anD. D. I remember them in second edition D anD. D being being written as in as an optional um, method for you know um, being able to cast spells. There's Dragon Magazine articles that have been written about power points. There's entire systems that have been written using PowerPoint. So it's not anything new people. It's just being reapplied in, in different ways and different methods, you know, with different math. That's the whole point of the, the creative, um, the creative ideas that make up tabletop role-playing games, just like the school of Yogg and just like these different schools of magic, go out and try those different systems and put them into your game. It changes the flavor. It changes the, the method that your classes use in order to cast spells. And it really makes the players think, about how it's used. Some are good, some are not so good, but either way, it's going to make um, the flavor and the story stand out. And at the end of the day, that's what a role-playing game is about. It's about the story. Mm-hmm. So so every sort of role-playing game basically has some system of restraining the caster to keep yeah. them from being sort of as cool as they want to be. But well, that's... Yeah. I mean, do you blame them though? Because I mean, imagine if you had a first level character and well, pretty much anything you speak, wish, or think about can create it. All right, I want a herd of unicorns, 30 dragons, and the biggest castle in the world is going to pop out of the ground right here. Now, all of a sudden, you've given him formless magic, and you've let his imagination run wild. But Hank Rin in his genius talks about that in the very last article called Formless Magic. And it allows you to be able to create any desired effect you want. But even he keeps that under control. He tells you that, you know, you need to make an int roll regardless of what the target is. Um, if you're successful on the on the int roll, and based on the quality of that roll, the GM has to improvise how good your spell was. And it's pretty much, I wish for a unicorn. Okay, you get a unicorn. It's three inches tall because you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it can happen. So even even he admits it. He says at the end, yes, this can get crazy. On a one through a five, it's a catastrophic failure. You know, a demon summons you or you die. On a six through a twelve, the effect happens of what the the caster wishes to do, but maybe it has a dire permanent cost. In other words, three inch unicorn and a 13 through 19, the effect happens again for the spell effect. Um, but maybe with a temporary cost, maybe your skin turns black or you lose 10 hit points. Um, something like that. Maybe not as severe as 10 hit points. Maybe a couple of hit points. And then well, let's 20 plus, it was meant to be limitless wonder. You know, you get your, your, all your wishes come true. And that spell does exactly what you want when you want with no cost whatsoever. Is that going to happen? Mm, probably not. And the, the few times it does, you want it, be, it to be something impactful. So even he comes up and, and talks about formless magic, but you need to be able to have those restrictions in the power level of spells because it keeps first level characters from becoming, you know, um, really grand wizards uh, from the very get go. Yeah, but I, see, this is this is sort of what I was getting at is is all of the other role playing systems. They, they have some way of, of restricting and sort of holding back your character as a caster. Like, you know, you take D&D, for example, you, you get some cantrips that do maybe X amount of damage, like, you know, maybe 1D10 or whatever kind of a thing. And then you get yep. a couple first level spells that you can cast maybe three, four times. You have, maybe you have two, three slots. And, that, sure. and that's it. And then you gotta, then you got to do this stupid ass long rest where you're sort of sitting there with your thumb up your butt. And, you know, other systems have different iterations or different ways of implying or restricting spellcasters. Now, you don't have to use any of the schools of magic inside of ICRPG. No, and you no, don't even you don't. have to use formless magic. You can literally no. just basically choose your spells and cast a gazillion times. And you sure. can, man, what is that one spell that they keep that I keep coming across? The, um, the Seekers. No roll to cast, emit a cluster of six missiles that seek a visible target and land 1d6 guaranteed hits. You don't roll to, to um, 
cast the spell, so they just it's like magic missile. There's no it's roll to hit. Missile. You're and rolling they, yeah. to see how many you cast. Oh, look at that. I rolled six. Now it's six times eight points. Of- you can cast that spell every action. What every round. other game are you doing that when you just sit down and start? But you know what? Even in his wisdom, Hankerin limits the amount of power that a spell that a magic user can have. As you know, beginning characters can only have as many spells as they have loot slots, equipped loot slots. Yeah, you can only carry around about a half a dozen spells or so because you're going to need at least a staff or a sword or something, clothes and a backpack uh, and your spell book. So there's three or four slots you're already guaranteed that are going to be used up by a mage. And if you have a spell book or a spell crystal or whatever to store some spells in, you're only going to get five or 10 spells at most in that spell book. You're not going to get a hundred pages and you're going to put a hundred spells in it. You're still going to be limited by your loot. So Mm -hmm. even if you're lucky and you carry around a a, a Yogg crystal, a spell book and a couple of scrolls, you're going to be carrying around maybe a dozen spells at most. Yes. Problem also rectified by making all magic damage a D8 which is really kind right. of actually cool. Exactly. Exactly. There, He limits it through the system and he limits it through loot. So that way you're not carrying around a whole slew of spells. Now, as you gain milestones, as your character grows in experience and wisdom um, through the game, if that's the kind of campaign you want to play, sure, give the character more spells or more powerful spells. So instead of a, um, a seeker missile that does just regular magic damage, now you're doing seeker missiles that do double magic damage or a plus four um, to the effort every time they use them, whatever the case may be, you know, they're just boosted mega damage, quote unquote, versions of the regular spells that they had. Um, it's yeah. a good way to be able to limit and control those. Yeah. As a DM controlling the power level and maybe even the flavor of your game is everything is done through loot, which just makes it you, the, the thing that I like about that idea is, is that it sort of, I, th- I feel that it eliminates these min-maxer turds that sort of drive me mental. I there have is... one of those in my in my group. And yeah, at there's... first, he was really turned off by the system because of that. Because yeah. he couldn't control the loot that he started out with. He wanted the loot that gave him the most bonuses. And I'm like, you don't get to choose those. You can yeah. only choose from this small list of stuff to start with. And he's like, but those only give you plus one or plus two. That's what you start out with. Well, that's not fair. And where's my skills? And where's my... And he started to use all these other rules from, you know, 5th edition, 4th edition, Pathfinder, Starfinder, all these other places. He's like, well, this is the way it's supposed to be done. And I'm like, no, not in this game. Yeah. Loot is controlled by the GM. What I give you is what you get. Oh, and it absolutely ticked him off when I would destroy loot. (laughs) I bet. You know what's funny, too? I played a game where you did that. Yeah, and the thing is, is like it, I don't feel like they're getting the loot that I give them. What I feel like is I'm going to let you do a random roll off a table, and you get what you get. Maybe you find a sandwich that heals you. Yeah. Sorry, that, that's what it's, I meant. That's what I meant. Either way, yeah. no one gets to really choose the right. plus five vorpal weapon that you know rolls ultimate every hit with no hit roll. No, no one gets that. It's it's rare. It's few and far between, and that's because you rolled a hundred on that chart. Yeah, maybe you get something cool. Maybe you get something yeah, but silly. They'll destroy it. In ICRPG, yeah. you can always have it taken away, stolen, destroyed, eaten up by a monster, you know, arm ripped off, whatever. If it's <laughs> unequipped, still, still trade it with the player, um, which I think adds a kind of an interesting dynamic now. Sure, like um, sure. in Savage Worlds with adventure cards, you can trade adventure cards at the yeah. beginning of the game among your players. And I see there's sure. a lot of cool and interesting things going on at my table where you know everybody's like okay i got this who can use this kind of a thing oh yeah or somebody Um, gets that one card that they're like i can't use this this makes no sense for me and somebody else across the table is like salivating going oh my god give me whatever you have i'll give you you know my third child yeah because they absolutely love it and they love the the capabilities that it's going to give them it's going to bring in that dimension um or that dynamic of um of the barter system you know here i'll I'll give you you can have this but i get first pick or of what comes yeah, and, up maybe loot, in the next one. Loot is used the same way in in ICRPG. You can trade it between characters anytime that you want, and it can completely change the capabilities. Because in ICRPG, you're only limited by what the group at the table wants to do. If you don't want um, magic users and clerics to be able to swap spells willy-nilly, okay, well, let's have a 
let's have a tribunal. What does everybody say? Yay or nay? Nay, 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 nay. Uh, I guess the nays win. It's, in, intelligence spells and wisdom powers are two separate things. You can't have them both. Um, I really like the idea of attunement for magic items as well. If you're going to equip that magic item, you're the only person that can ever use it. You, you know, you maybe you want to drop it off at your house because you, you want to unequip it. Maybe you just want to throw it in the ground and walk away. And, and I wouldn't count it as part of your 10. I like attunement. I look at attunement as the, the magic item is intelligent. I'm not saying it has a voice. It can speak and act on its own. I'm saying that the magic has a certain feeling it is powerful enough to know when the individual with the right aura energy magical ability charisma whatever is holding and touches it and it likes that person so it becomes attuned to that person it's kind of like the the um, concert cellist that only uses you know the cello that is 300 years old and cost him ten thousand dollars it's his favorite instrument and he cannot play as good as he does unless he has that cello to me that's an attuned magical item that's how that works hmm. that is an interesting way of looking at it I'm, I'm i'm like in the venom idea where you touch this thing you spend a few minutes maybe stroking it and talking sweetly to it and then before you know it like it's magic his like um, mm -hmm. tentacleized itself into your mm -hmm. hand and if anybody mm -hmm. else tries to touch it the magic doesn't work for them um, yeah. or you get shocked or you get bitten <laughs> or you get spiked or you get thorned or something yeah I mean that's the whole point of magic yeah it's it's there's multiple ways to be able to to string up that cat so to speak but um, I really like the way attunement can manage and maintain the magic items and keep them unique to your characters especially if you're one of those GMs that is always increasing the power level and giving the magic items and the different powers and abilities as the characters grow, as their magic level grows. You know, yeah. you get the magic sword that grows a little longer, is a little wider, uh, bursts into flames, can cut through stone, petrifies the enemy, and next thing you know, it's fighting on its own. You know, it, it grows as the character grows in power. I think that can be really cool. And attunement is the very beginning, the base of that whole process. I, I guess I'm going to have to sort of maybe rethink my my thought process on the attunement thing because I just thought of something. If magic items attune to you and nobody else can use them, how do you get loot from other people? Like, let's say you, you come across a, a, a rogue band of of bandits, so to speak, and you know you see this one guy jump off his horse and he shoots like a fire arrow at you and you're like, oh, I want that kind of a thing. And I guess you wouldn't be able to if you went with with my shtick. So yeah, I guess we're going to have to... Well, you, you have to... The, the one question you have to ask or the rule that you have to come up with is can attunement change? Can the wizard, the wizard that uses the magic missile wand that has formed to his hand grip so well that he loves it, he lovingly holds it. If you steal it from him, can you attune that weapon to you? Does it take time? Does it take money? Does it take effort? Does it take a role every day? Do you have to go on an epic quest? That's something that you need to ask yourself of whether or not on your world at your table, do you want it to be able to do that? Is it a hard, fast rule of once you attune it, it's mine. It's got my DNA, my signature. It won't do anything but me. That is Lancelot's sword. Only Lancelot can hold it. Okay, that's perfectly okay. Or you can do the opposite of what I was suggesting. If I steal Lancelot's sword, how can I get it to work for me? Do I need to go take it to the Lady of the Lake, put it into some lava, or kill a dragon with it, and then it'll deem me worthy, and then I can use all the powers of Lancelot's sword? That is completely up to your table and how you want it. And that's just two examples. There could be multiple others that we've even talked about. Mm -hmm. But that's I'm good thinking, stuff, man. That's good stuff. I'm thinking hard int, or you turn into pink mist. Just sure. like bright. Have you seen sure. bright? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Don't touch that magic item. Oh, right? yeah. absolutely love bright. I absolutely love bright. I want to see Will Smith turn that into a, a five season, 10 season campaign of shadow run. Cause that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. Absolutely let's, in love with bright. Let's go five. You know what? You, you know that most things that go past five jump the shark at some point and he's going to end up, you know, doing some kind of weird, crazy puppet show with the ogres and that stupid thing. And you're <laughs> yeah, just going to be like, what is going on here? I, I um, would be happy with two seasons, to be honest with you. Anything right? that pushes the barrier of storytelling and includes the worlds of, of, of role-playing games on TV into live action stuff that is well-acted, well-produced, and well-written. And mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody says. 
bright isn't a genius epiphany of work. It is not, you know, the Bible, but it, it is some pretty good stuff. It's some pretty good stories there. And I think there's huge potential for a lot of um, other games or excuse me, other episodes, other characters, other storylines, multiple storylines at the same time. I could go on and on about it. I'm a big yeah. fan of Shadowrun and uh, amongst a few other games that I've played over the years. And I think having a big star like Will Smith and and the talent that was in that um, that particular movie, I think should it, it deserves to to move on. But it, it, I, waited, um, I waited 20 years for Avengers. I can wait 20 years for Bright. Yeah, it didn't have to be perfect. It didn't have to be no, spectacular. It I don't think it needs to be. It doesn't need to be a blockbuster $120 million movie because that'll ruin it. It needs to be dark, slightly off, imperfect, kind of in a corner missing here and there kind of thing. Um, it's that kind of grungy type storyline or movie, I think. It's the feel, the flavor that I get when I watch it. It just had to be good enough because it was right up my alley. You know, I'm I'm invested in stories and shows like that. It just needed to be good enough. So I think anyways. that one was just that. It was just good enough. It was somewhere between a really good um, movie for TV and a really um, inexpensive, high quality film. It was somewhere in between that to me. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a big fan of Will Smith. I appreciate him as a person and as a talent and the artist that he is. But um, the storyline, the fact that it was Shadowrun, Orcs, Magic, it was all done in a modern age, not in a neo modern, you know, a cyberpunk kind of role. Um, it was really relatable. The story was easy to follow. It wasn't, it was enough surprises to keep me on the edge of my seat, but not enough so to where I was, you know, begging for more all the time. But I knew I liked it because at the end of the movie, I was like, no, it can't end here. There's so <laughs> many open ended stories. It can't end here. I was so disappointed, but so gratified that someone was smart enough to be able to make that movie. Either um, way, we got to get back to ICRPG or we're never going to finish this podcast. I was just going to say, we took a sharp left turn. Schools of Magic. <laughs> you are not committed or, or you are not forced to take one of these schools. They are just options, right? I mean, they're just... Right. It, it just says choosing to commit to only one of these types can add a new dimension to your character. But it just says you can choose one. I mean, granted, you probably don't need to be one mage cannot have multiple schools. That's not the whole point of the whole schools of magic concept, but there's a school of nature. There's a school of the gods. Of course, we talked about school of Yaga already. And then there's wild mages where you don't choose any school and you don't use any spell books. Your magic backfires as normal and you always use spell burn. There's some advantages to that, but I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of penalties that make that a lot harder. Yeah. I like that. Each one of them is, 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 you know, it's a little bit of a fluff school of nature sure. basically says that, um, any Good. spell, yeah, any spell that you have has some kind of natural theme. You don't use sure. spell books, but your magic never backfires. So right. essentially, you, you can have 10 spell slots or, or you know, your spells occupy a slot. One of the nice or neat things about this is is you can store your spells in acorns, bark chips, um, you know, some kind of berry or something like that that you would eat, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really yeah, neat. Not having to a spell book, people would think that's a disadvantage because the advantage of being a mage, an int spellcaster, an intelligence spellcaster, is that you can put 10 spells in a book and that book only takes up one carried or equipped slot in your equipment. But then it can be destroyed and that sucks for a mage. But if you're a member of the school of nature, now you don't use spell books and your magic never backfires. So all your spells take up one gear slot. So yeah. now you don't have to worry about all your eggs in one basket. So what if you lose one spell? You've got five or six others that you've got equipped or stored that you don't have to worry about. So you pull that acorn out of your backpack and you fill the slot of where that other one was gone. And now you can cast that spell whenever you Yeah, the school of gods is right up my alley. I've said it before. I love playing the priest class. I like mm -hmm. the healing. I like the buffing. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I don't need to be in the action. But what I like to be doing is making other people's actions more um, more profound. The, Mo better. Mo better. So the school of gods says that your spells are prayers and require no space to possess. Okay, all of them, is awesome. Yeah, all of them always equipped. And in return, you must answer to your own backfire rules as shown below. Where is the backfire rules as shown below so, for that? Well not, well, not below. He means in the next column that says backfire. Oh, I got so I whenever, see it. Yeah. So whenever you roll a one on your attempt, you roll a d4. So you rolled for a spell. 
You roll to hit, and of course you rolled a one, which dun dun dun, something bad happens. Now you're going to roll a one to four. Now on the little backfire chart, it says on a one, the spell's desired effect is inverted. In other words, it's backwards. If you roll a two, the spell sparks erratically, and it does magic damage to you, the caster. Yikes. Yeah, I like ouch. that. So for three, your spell burn die maxes out, which means you now have to roll spell burn die to find out how long it's going to take before you can cast spells again. Um, and if you roll a four, the, a wild arc bounces about doing weapon damage to a random ally. So um, yeah, <laughs> that that's cool too for various um, reasons. Just yeah. thinking for added excitement, you could go to, um, I'm not sure what the class is inside of D and D. There is a, um, like sort of like the same thing, sort of a backfire chart that has like a hundred different things. You could turn yourself into a potted plant kind of a thing. Like, oh yeah, you know what? You know which um, game that I just sparked my memory. You said that um, Frank has told me this before. DCC has a great backfire chart. There's no oof. reason why you could not plug that in there and use the backfire chart instead of the backfire rules here. Use that backfire chart for a, a mage that's using the school of gods. I'll have to check my my DCC books out. I think I have some. If not, I'm going to ask yeah. Harrison it's about in the main, that. It's in the main rule book under, yeah, under Spell Backfire. It's a big belt backfire chart. I think it had 100 different entries, 1 to 100 um, entries on Backfire, what happens when your spells go awry. That's and cool. And there's some fun ones. Oh, there's some <laughs> hysterical ones in there. Now, I think that would be a lot of fun to throw into a game, depending on the game that you're playing, you know, the type in the world and the story and whatnot. Last but not yeah. least, we're going to do Wild Mages. That's the last one of the Schools of Magic. If you choose no schools of magic to commit to, you may not use spell books. Now, it does not say you do not use them or you cannot use them. It says you may not use spell books. Your magic backfires as normal and always uses spell burn. So every time you cast a spell, you will, you will, um, every time you success, is it when you, when every time you fail a spell casting, right? So every time you would use spell burn, that's how spell burn, spell burn works. Um, when you fail a, uh, to use a spell, the D4 will go down by one. So it starts at four. And, and you use a spell burn die every single time that you do that. So it's going to go down by one when you miss. You are also shunned by many established magic users and wizards institutions as a mere dabbler. So not only do you not have to worry about spell books and don't have a school of magic, but your magic, you have to use the backfire chart and you have to use spell burn. Spellburn is pretty sweet. I do like that. So if you yeah. if you are using Spellburn and turning your die back, um, does it is Spellburn's D six, isn't it, or D four? It's a D four, and you and it starts at four. And every time you fail a spell casting check, you move it down one. So it starts at four. You failed. It goes to three. You cast a spell. You were successful. It stays at three. You cast another spell. It's successful. Stays at three. You cast a spell and failed. It goes to two. You cast a spell and failed. It goes to one. Now, if you fail at casting one more time, you are going to lose your ability to cast magic for 1d4 turns. I uh, gotcha. That's yeah, how Spellburn works. I was kind of reading it that that Wild Mage or yeah, the Wild Mage would turn it back. Every time you cast a spell, you turn your, your die back anyways. If you fail, you turn it back, say, like twice. So yeah, so the wild mage would turn it whether he casts a successful spell or not. Or not, he yeah. Always uses spell burn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So so after four castings, the wild mage is not going to be able to use a spell for a little. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So the spell books come in blank and already written forms. Uh, they can be used to store and carry spells in combat form. They take up one slot, but are flammable. They're and flammable. And if destroyed, right. you lose your spells. Love it. That would suck. That would suck if you that one, you know how you roll random hit to see what equipment that you have equipped that gets hit by the spell instead of, you know, or destroys a piece of equipment. The DM was going to roll that D10. And of course, he's going to roll a 10 where you keep your spell book. And guess what? Your spell book now has a big old flaming hole in it. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm allowing players to, t you know, in their spell books t to take the time to scribe out of their spell books, in and out of their spell books. So you could make a scroll as a mage of, say, sure, like sure. Seeker Missiles and give it to your fighter and your fighter rips it in half or reads the arcane runes off it yeah. and he yeah. gets or, to or do reads that. the trigger word or whatever. Yeah, sure. Man, sure. and then I'm going to apply backfire to him too if he fails his roll and stuff like that. So we've already talked about the backfire, but I see below it is holy backfire. So I think we screwed up, Victor. I think uh, the school of gods is the holy backfire. 
not the backfire. I think we need, I think we You are correct. Y- yes, you are correct. It is wholly backfire. I think that's what it meant to say. Could mm-hmm. be a little typo there by Henkren. I'll have to ask him when I see him this weekend, but I think you're right. The backfire rules are for other mages such as the wild mage or just the regular. Uh, you just got to rub it in that you're going to hang out with Henkren this weekend, are you? I'll have to ask him when I see him again uh, this weekend cuz yeah. I'm hanging out with him and you're not, loser. <laughs> uh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, why are you so mean to me, man? Uh, Holy Backfire. What happens here? So on a one, the spell is forgotten until after a night's sleep. That's actually pretty cool, man. Here's a list. You screw up, knock that spell off your list until the next day. Red check. Chick-chick. The oh, gods no, no, no. are. You got to look at number two. The gods are angered. Accelerate any GM timers to one. <laughs> yeah. sorry about your bad luck Score. but talk about messing with fate oh my gosh yeah that's slick man evil bolsters your foal your that's foe three yep heal one enemy for one heart oh man oh, yeah. what yeah ouch yeah that hurts a touch she is a fickle girl number four is a fog of fear erupts escalate the current target by one for the remainder of the encounter oh so everything gets harder by one the current target number, the room target, goes up oh, by one. Man. Could you imagine Dang. duffing that a couple of times in a row and oh, rolling no. that four? Oh, no. Yeah, no, you're you're at 13 and you missed it twice or three times and now everybody's rolling 16s. It becomes a hard target and it's not even a hard target. Yeah, that's, uh, that's insane. So we did spell creation. You make a hard int roll and you can create basically any spell. See... I really like the effort, the idea, like we were talking earlier, 10 points Mm -hmm. of effort Mm -hmm. to create something, because I don't like the idea of being able to do something instantaneously inside of combat. It takes takes time. It takes, quote unquote, effort in order for you to be able to build up your energy, build up your momentum, build up your knowledge or whatever you're doing. Sure. I agree with that also. Yeah. I'm only using effort in combat. If, if we're in the middle of blasting yeah. some goblins up, yeah. you're not just going to be able just to create a spell because you're, you're distracted. Yeah. Like, you're not concentrating. If in, your- yeah, if I'm in moments or minutes, I, I won't even bother. I, I mean, I'll only use the effort. If I'm in hours or days, I won't even bother. No, They're going to no. come up. They're going to have the time, especially if there's no threat, if there's no immediate distraction or, or danger to them. Yeah, uh, it, hours or hours or days they're going to come up with the spell and they're going to make it up and they're going to scroll and it's going yeah. to be there for them it's to use as often as they want very similar to the to the rule of taking 20 inside of uh oh yeah D&D. oh yeah sure yeah sure so the last part says now it has begun so if you're a player rolling up your first character or starting gm looking for insights into icrpg's mechanics here's the place to start this is cool because this isn't something that you see inside of other um other role-playing games where you you know like because it's a new system it's like here's here's a little deal for your mage or here's a little deal for your fighter to go through um it gives you a bit of a setup tells you some of the obstacles that you can fight and it allows you and the player if you're both or new to the game to set up a little scenario where you can play that character just sort of get the feel of how it's supposed to be played and that's awesome Sure. For those of you that are keeping up with us, we are on page 48 of the ICRPG core second edition rulebook. It is called trials. And what, um, yeah, I totally agree with you. He, he goes right into it in that second paragraph where it says trials are micro scenarios. You can play solo or with your group to get accustomed to how the game flows and what makes it t- unique. Um, yeah, I think you're right. He uses these trials as a different, um, kind of a starter, not a starter, but like, um, an adventure introduction encounter. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you see them very similarly or you see them in similar products when you get starter sets. So like the D&D starter set, it's a very similar example, only it has a lot more pages in the beginning adventure. But in the beginning adventure, it tells you what the GM is doing, what everyone is rolling. It's giving you the, all the basics that you need. And that's what his trials give you. They give you the Grey Hill Fire. They give you the Skull of the Cyclops and Behemoth. And those are three main adventures in the different worlds um, that Hankerin has created in his rulebook to kind of just give you a feel for this is what happens in a warp shell game. He starts out with the setup. He starts out with the first couple of um, major points of interest and what you need to accomplish and the conclusion. Every single one, it's that simple. The setup, the three things they need to do, and the conclusion. You go to Skull of Cyclops, it's the same thing. You go to the behemoth at the end, 
it's the same thing. And it's, it's really genius because you can play these by yourself. He gives you your target numbers for each room. He tells you if there's any dex checks, the number of hearts you need for challenges, and whether there's any skill checks or anything that he wants you to do. And then he tells you it after the setup and all those encounters, this is the conclusion. If you got this far, what will you do? You know, and the second one, if you get, if, if you've retrieved the relic, you see a red hooded figure staring back from the void. I mean, it just leaves open-ended questions and it's really, really smart. They're really short and they're really concise. And I, again, this is the genius of Rune Hammer Games. Hankerin outdid himself when he put in the trials and I think it was a really neat idea. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic way to wrap up the character creation system. All that said sure, done. First thing you do, you make your character. And what do you want to do? I want to roll some dice, but my friends aren't here. Yeah. Oh, let's try this solo. What happens if I do this? And I grab the particle cannon and it says here that I need a wisdom check or an intelligence check to investigate. So I'm going to do that and try a couple of rolls to get my feet wet on how weapon damage works and how effort works. And, oh, I'm a maid, so I can cast spells. But what is this? And I'm sure questions will start rolling. And that's when you start reaching out to the community, reaching out to Hanker in or looking at all the videos and trying to figure out all this, how all these crazy rules add up to one of the best role playing it, it it literally is it, it's icrpg is mind-boggling in its simplicity and it's that is this is one the one thing that i love about it it's it is so simple that you don't need to start you, you're never picking the book up to look at you know what do i got to do here this magic system that he's got in his game um, the more that I hear the actual plays of ICRPG playing, being played, like Sea of Rust and um, the Aliens one was really good as well, the more you realize that restricting your players really sort of sucks the life out of the story of the game. Um, with this magic system and this game in particular with no classes, no levels, it's, a, it's just basically... Um, you know, even even the spell system, there's there's no spell levels. You can choose any spell you want. You can be devastatingly powerful right out of the gate. It's just phenomenal, man. It's like, you, you know, you actually feel like you're a badass mage right out of the gate. Yeah, I had one guy that um, had played a lot of D20 games, you know, Pathfinder, D&D. Um, he's a fairly experienced player, and he likes to play mages. And the first thing he told me after the first game of ICRPG that we played, and this is with my players group. These are the guys that I play with. You know, every couple of weeks we get together and we do a bunch of games. We've done campaigns for years. I, I, this is my most recent group. I really love them. You guys are awesome, by the way, if I haven't said that in a few a few months or whatever. Um, and the guy told me at the end of that night, he's like, this game is awesome. For the first time as a mage, as a first level or a, a intro new character mage, I actually felt like I could make a difference, like I could do something, even if it was just, you know, firing, you know, magic arrows at the enemy. At least I was felt like I was being effective and I was and I could take a hit and not worry. And everyone else was taking as much damage as I was. And we were all in the same boat. There was no I'm too weak. Oh, I'm, you know, the fair damsel in the background fainting because I saw blood, something silly. And he says my spells and my magic and the, the loot that I have that all clicked for him and it really made him a, a more effective player. And he absolutely bit into the entire ICRPG genre. And now he's like, when are we going to play this? When are we going to play Ghost <laughs> When are we going to play Alphine some more? When are we going to finish the last adventure we have? And I, that last adventure was a one-off. He's like, no, I want to play my character again. And he just it totally into it. And he absolutely loves it. I mean, he was a doubter at first, just like a few of my other players, because I told him it's kind of like a D20 light system. And they have not found a D20 light system, at least not in this point in their experience, that they liked, that took away, a lot of them took away a lot of the rules and the accounting and the math and the, the complexity of the game that they like, that they enjoy. And I get it. I, I like the complexity of games too. I like games to be hard. What's the point of being a nerd if you can't play a hard game, right? But um, once they started to realize the beauty of letting the system fall away to show you the wonderfulness that is a group story, they were hooked. Even to this day, every single game we play, whether it's Shadowrun, Deadlands, Rifts, whatever it may be, the first thing they're asking going, hey, I wonder how this will play an ICRPG. Yeah, I find myself doing that so often now. Yep, every single game you play, like this would be so much better in IC. This would be so much <laughs> faster in ICRPG. I don't need a calculator in ICRPG to figure out my to hit roll. You know, it's been forty five minutes and my character's not done yet. I could have killed. I, I could have you know taken on a behemoth by now in ICRPG. I could have jumped out the warp shell and killed a few things by now, and we're still making characters. Yeah, 
it, it's just the simplicity is its genius and and i really appreciate it for that when i played the um norberg adventure that I created um, the four people that I had create characters. We were all four of them were done in 20 minutes, like done. Yeah. Done. Yeah. It's that fast. Even I've played with people who've never played a role playing game before in ICRPG. And it's taken maybe 30 minutes to get them acclimated to the basics. You know, just this is a to hit roll. This is your target. And this is what these bonuses mean. You add those to the dice as appropriate. Here's the points that you get. And it's easy for them if you visualize it too. use glass beads, um, dice, uh, whatever poker chips or whatever you have lying around. You get six points. Here's six beads. One point can go towards your strength. You can put one to strength. one, And so now they have a visual aid that helps them get through that. And then you just convert that visual aid into a number and they can record it. And then that clicks in their head going, oh, three beads means three bonus means three to my 20 sided. And within five minutes, they get it. They get the whole general mechanic of what makes up the entire game. From that point on, it's just a matter of, you know, keeping them from haunting at the back of the house because they want to play more games. Mm -hmm. Have you um, ever done any kind of sewing? You know what I mean? Sure, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, my grandmother maybe. was great at teaching us how to do some needlepoint. And my aunts did it for a long time. And, of course, me being the oldest of four, the, the oldest son of, of four daughters. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've done a little bit. Um, do you know the, I think they're, I don't know if they're called thimbles, but you can get like rubber thimbles that you put on your fingertips to help you push the needles through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You need to stop and buy some of those so that the next time we record, when you're tapping your table, <laughs> you'll have, you'll have soft rubber fingertips, my friend. <laughs> Coach yourself. Do not touch the table. You're you're a very animated talker, and your new microphone is picking up every one of <laughs> those bad good. boys. I need to turn it down just a little bit. I need to I need to put it on a suspension like yours. Is I have uh -huh. the arm here. I just don't. My um, the top of this is not the same. The top of yeah. this is not the same. Mm -hmm. It needs to have the one like you have. Yeah, I had to oh, buy yeah. it special because it is the, yeah. the the mic you have in the mic. The, there we have the same mics, and yeah. this thing is really heavy, which you know. So. You oh yeah a, oh yeah for sure yeah, yeah it needs um not only does it need that special carriage but it needs an arm that'll take a heavy weight um, yeah because it is it's pretty hefty despite the base it's pretty hefty mike yeah then you got to get yourself some sweet bike nuts and you're good to go <laughs> you'll be, you have a perfect setup um that awesome. said let's take us out with uh the end of the show whatever section we're going into uh, it's getting late <laughs> You can reach us at MurderHoboShow at gmail.com or get us on Twitter if you can keep it under 140 characters at MurderHoboShow. Or, of course, over at the Google Plus page for Murder Hobo Show under the Nerds International banner. You can reach out to myself directly at the Google Plus page for In His Card Role Playing Game along with Gary, my pal, my buddy. And um, let us know what you want to hear and what you want us to talk about next. Otherwise, we'll keep going through the rule book. Mm -hmm. Coolness. Be sure to swing by the Murder Hobo Show on Podbean. And check out the show notes for some cool links to creative people, places, and things. And don't forget to check out our other podcast. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we do play other games besides ICRPG. Our other podcast is about the Savage Rifters. We are the Savage Rifters, and we go over and play some Savage Rifts for Savage Worlds. A lot of fun. I am working on an ICRPG conversion for Rifts. But damn, that world is huge. So that might be another year before everyone sees that. Either way, we talk about ICRPG and we talk about ICRPG Core 2.0 every day, all the time, 24-7. Gary and I are going back and forth. Um, totally looking forward to it. Looking forward to whatever new stuff Hankerin has up the pipe. We'll find out. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, tune in next time. We will have another action-packed show as we will be tackling. What are we doing next time, Victor? You know what we're doing? World Primers, bro. We're going to talk about Alfheim and the different places warp in shell. Alfheim. Warp Shell. I want to do Warp Shell. Well, you want to start with Warp Shell? Let's do Warp Shell. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's talk Warp Shell. Sounds good to me. Fantastic. All right. Peace out, everybody. See you. The Murder Hobo Show is not affiliated with or endorsed by any companies mentioned on this show. Any of the products mentioned on our show or appear on our website are the property and copyright of their respected owners. All items are used under fair use and education or review purposes. All other items are the intellectual property of the Murder Hobo Show, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.